Let's take a closer look at the multi-source reasoning question type by looking at an actual example. Remember that on the multi-source reasoning questions of the integrated reasoning section of the GMAT, you're going to have your ability to look at multiple sources of information tested. Often it's going to show up in terms of uh, two to three tabs, and the tabs will work much like your internet browser will work, where by clicking on a tab, it will bring the information from that tab onto the screen. Next, the information you find on the tab can be in the form of text, charts, tables. In the case of the example we'll be looking at, it will be three different emails. And only by clicking on the tab will you bring it to the front. What's important is all three tabs will not be visible at the same time, but rather you'll have to move amongst them as necessary. And last, you'll get these multiple dichotomous choice questions, which are just yes-no questions and you'll get three statements per single multi-source reasoning question. So to answer this particular question correctly, we have to answer all three yes-no statements correctly. There is no partial credit on the integrated reasoning section. Let's take a look at this example. We have, in this case, email one, email two, and email three. When these pop up, the first thing you want to do is read the three sources of information. Don't try to memorize all the details, but rather get a sense of the structure. How do the tabs relate to each other? So in the first email, we've got an attorney writing to his clients. And in this email, he's writing about a settlement offer. In the next email, the client responds to their attorney. And it seems that in this email, the client's happy that there's been a settlement offer, but thinks the settlement offer is too low and wants to counter negotiate with a higher offer. We get our third email and it's the attorney back to his clients saying that he had responded or that they talked to the industry about uh, of a higher settlement, but that that company felt it was too high. And now the attorney suggests another alternative. So this is it. We're not memorizing all the data, we're not taking detailed notes here, but rather we know the structure of the emails to each other. Attorney to client about a settlement offer, client back to attorney saying, uh, let's counter negotiate with a higher offer, and then the attorney back to the client saying they thought that offer was too high, and this is where I think we should go to. That understanding of the structure and how the tabs relate to each other is key to solving these questions correctly. So now let's turn our attention to the first yes-no statement. The first one says that Steinholm Industries will not settle the case without an agreement in place regarding the media. Now there is reference to the media in email number three in the very last sentence. If you agree not to speak to the media regarding this dispute and ask for $440,000 in settlement monies, they will likely settle immediately. This is the only reference to the media in all three emails. So here's the problem. Well, it does seem from this email that the company would like the media not to be involved. At no point do they make it clear in either three of the emails that this is a necessity to settle the case. So this first statement is too extreme. The answer is no. We don't have enough information to indicate that the company will only settle once an a, a agreement is in place regarding media. Let's look at the second statement. The initial hope for settlement amount was $530,000. In this, let's go back to our first email, where when we find out the settlement offer that's come through, the lawyer says to his client, hey, I know this is not less than 15% of what we had initially hoped for in the second to last sentence. Note, $450,000 is where the attorney thinks the final settlement will go with the initial proposal of $400,000 from Steinholm Industries. And the lawyer says, if we get $450,000, that's not less than 15% of what we initially hoped for. Just because he says 450000 would not be less than 15% of the original hope for settlement, we specifically don't know what that settlement amount was, that hope for settlement amount was. We know 450000 is not less than 15%, but that doesn't give us any indication or any information that would allow us to solve for the specific hope for settlement amount. 
So in statement two, it's also a no. We don't know exactly what that hope for amount was. We just know that $450,000 is not less than 15% of that hope for amount. Now let's look at our third statement. The client's counsel has a vested interest in avoiding the media and settling the case quickly. Now, it could be just logic at this point where you say, well, yeah, the, the client's counsel is going to have some profit from this settlement. So the idea that the client, uh, the, the attorney is going to profit isn't far-fetched. It's a matter of making sure the statement as we've given it is yes, or yes, it can be inferred or no, it can be inferred based solely off the information we have in these emails. And in these emails, when you see, well, in, specifically in the statement, when it says a vested interest in avoiding, it means that it's a personal stake in the outcome. And there's nothing in this passage to suggest that the attorney has any expectation of financial gain if the settlement occurs quickly, nor does it state anything about the, the particular, uh, the uh, client's attorney having any uh, desire to avoid the media. Now, you may remember when you're working in these types of questions and inference questions in general, you are answering the question or this statement, this yes, no statement, based solely off the information we've been given. And in the three emails that were given, there's no indication of a vested interest for the client's counsel. So we'd have to mark no. So remember when working with these multi-source reasoning questions, two big takeaways. One, always start by getting the gist of the tabbed information. Get a general idea of what's in those tabs, but more importantly, an understanding of how the tabs relate to each other. Next, return to the tabs as you need to, to research any information for the individual questions. You will be able to go back and forth amongst the three tabs as much as you want, so don't feel the need to memorize anything or get bogged down in details, but rather getting a good understanding of the general structure will let you know where, which tab you should return to to find the necessary information to answer the question you've been given. 